Mr. Jeff, is it Moran? Warren. Moran, however you want to pronounce it. Are, are you related to Aaron Moran from Happy Days? Uh, Not that I know. I really don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly don't know. Most of my Moran family is actually, I think quite a few of them are in like Pennsylvania, but <clears throat> I, I have no idea. I just know like in high school when I was a quarterback, it was a moron when I did something wrong and <laughs> just kind of, kind of swapped a out for an o, we were good to go so so where so you've been around a lot where'd you where are you originally from i'm actually from the boise area right outside of boise in a town called nampa idaho um <clears throat> i grew up here and then pff, shit i'd say the uh right after high school i left i went to wazoo for a year and then i came back for a short amount of time and then i moved to atlanta georgia and then from there i've lived in like 20 different states I've lived in Canada. I've uh, I've been all over, and I just came back to Idaho about a year, year and a half ago. So I haven't that, been back here for a really long. Was that mainly work related? All the different places you lived. Yeah, I was working. Well, we'll get into that whole job and the industry and everything because it'll tie into what we're talking about. But yeah, I was okay. I was opening up offices and stuff like that in different areas of the country, and for a little while I was just a, a technician and then a sales rep and, and moved around all over the place. I think the longest I ever stayed in place was Florida for like four years. That sounds like my life. Well, yeah, we were talking about before <laughs> this and then we were initially going to talk about the poor Duchess of Sussex and Prince, <laughs> but that's old news. And we're turning to turn to find out that she's kind of full of shit of some of the things she's saying. And, what happened in Boulder the other day? Because we both, uh, I went to the University of Colorado, lived in Boulder, and then, you know, we're both hunters, and it has to do, again, with guns, and I don't want to get into the whole thing, but, you know, they talk about, it's always something like this, and then they want to put a Band-Aid on, let's ban guns, but at the same time, mm -hmm. it turns out this guy was a fucking nut, and it's, uh, let me ask you this, let me ask you this, we we both seem, I, I know I'm not crazy, and I'm pretty sure you're not crazy, so, have you ever had thoughts about going and shooting, just randomly taking down 10 people? No. Yeah. Cause you're not crazy. <laughs> no. And I think, man, it, it's hard that they, they never talk about the mental health side of things. And mm -hmm. I guess we can get into that too. But I, <clears throat> I mean, they, they said going all the way back. I mean, he's not from here. He's not from the United States. And, and it's sad, he's been here quite he a while though. Him. Yeah. Yeah, he has, but, they, they said going all the way back to like high school and stuff, he was posting things about yep. how if, or people were talking about how they knew him in high school. And if anybody said anything bad to him, he was going to turn them in for, for being race haters or racism, or they, he was going to pull that card. And it's like, that may not have, that probably didn't have anything to do with it. But I mean, if you're, if you're acting a fool or you're acting like an asshole, like you get called out for it, you can't play that. But he uh, he had some he had a lot of problems going way back when and they even i think i watched something yesterday where they talked about he was on the fbi's radar for some time and and no, you hear that to be you on the radar and, yeah i i don't know what it is but so i actually if we want to go back even farther i was less than five minutes away from the school in florida when the last, when that big shooting happened oh, i was working down there at the time um <clears throat> yeah i think parkland or I can't remember which one it was, but that came out really quickly that they had already talked to that kid and there had been like a number of issues with him in the past and people were concerned about him and, and he had been tipped or the FBI had been tipped off to him as well as like local authorities, but nobody ever did anything. Yeah. And it's the same situation here is they knew something was wrong with the guy, but they just decided to ignore it. Or I, I guess, what does it take on that end of things to, to actually go in and, and explore somebody if if they're like does he have to be linked to a terrorist group or anything like that to be able yeah. to e even discuss it or i don't know Th that's kind of the uh <clears throat> they never talk about that side of things it's just like oh let's ban guns and <clears throat> that's really not going to do anything it's just not you know they talk about background checks that's fine but they should be just like uh, nowadays with people, if you want to have kids, you should have a full mental evaluation done. If you're going to carry a weapon, let alone raise kids. 
And that just seems that they just seem like, oh, it's a banned guns, banned guns. And it's always the nut jobs. I'm sorry. It's mental illness, which is not addressed. And that's where it comes down to. You know, like I said, no one's sane goes and mows down 10 people or more. You know, they've got something, not, something's wrong. It de- so I will go back to my life in the past and, and some of the things that I've seen. And I remember I was working in Louisville, Kentucky years ago. And I was in the inner city and there was a, there was a dispute over a video game. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, funny, that's, but there was a dispute over a video game that ended up in a shooting where like six people died. And it was a, an argument that just went out of control. And, but at the same time, they, it wasn't just one person like going off on everybody else. It's just, you run into stupid situations like that. But for the most part, all of these things that they want to call mass shootings are, are people that aren't, like mentally stable and I don't know what they're talking about with the background checks. I know that I've, I've seen one proposal that they offered out that was saying that, that you have to, even to keep that the guns that you have, you have to go through like a a mental evaluation and they can talk to your ex spouse and everything. And that just doesn't seem fair. Um, (laughs) Mm -hmm. We all call everybody crazy at that point. Yeah, Um, seriously. (laughs) <laughs> little 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 dick uh, she'll name everything about you what's wrong with you suddenly <laughs> yeah um so it's i don't know the the background checks are one thing but i think if you get into that the concept of banning different things and, and banning the different magazines and everything it's that that really has nothing to do with it because you're it's not going to stop and you hear all the time it's not going to stop the people that um are, are criminals from getting the weapons that they want. Mm-hmm. And True. people always wonder, people always wonder how they're like, how are they going to do that? If they're not, um, how are they going to do that? If they're not part of, or if the guns are on the streets, if they take all the guns away, then how are they going to do it? Well, I can tell you. So for the 15 years that I was out moving around and living in different cities, for the most part, I was working in inner cities. I was a door to door salesman. I sold like alarms and surveillance systems and everything else like that. I was in inner city Chicago one time and I was in this lady's house and I was talking to her and then there was a couple gunshots and turns out like the UPS driver um, at the house right next door got blown away through the door. And that was on the news, wasn't it? Didn't it? A couple years ago? I think so. This was like 2009, maybe. Okay. Yeah. 2009. I mean, it was a long time ago. It, it happens often in that city, but those people aren't allowed to have the guns that they have in the first place in, in that city, that city doesn't allow it. Um, I remember going into a house one time where the guy told me straight up, he's like, don't, you can't go in that room. You can't go in that room. And you could smell like they were cooking stuff in there. And <laughs> I, I don't want to know about it. It's not my business. And, and then one of the rooms, basically the weapons that were laid out in that room that he wanted like, extra security in that one specific room for himself the weapons that were laid out in that room were not legal in america period and how he got those i don't know i don't care i just turn my turn my back and i walk away at that point but people they bring in truckloads of that stuff and it Mm -hmm. comes from different countries and however they want to ship stuff in i mean i have friends in all sorts of different departments and that's constantly the issue is they're bringing that stuff in on boats they're bringing it on trains they're bringing it under the ground and hidden in compartments and people are going to get them it doesn't matter if you even if you pass background checks like background checks aren't really going to do background checks might help in situations like this where the guy yesterday or the guy the other day like had mental illness and he did purchase the gun legally but it's not going to help the situation where I mean, you could go to any at any inner city in the United States. I promise you, you can walk up to any street corner at certain times of the day and ask somebody for a weapon and they'll be able to find it. Yeah. And that's that's the problem that needs addressed. And apparently the whole mm. government and everything, their agenda is, is completely different. They just think, oh, if we if we ban this, then I don't even know. I don't know what their agenda is at this point. I don't want to speculate and I don't want to get into politics, but no. Yeah. Well, I'll just say this. Look at England. They have been guns. And, and so what do people do? They use vehicles and knives. Right. (laughs) So what are we going to ban next vehicles and knives? You know, they'll find a way. So anyways. Yeah. And 
I think it, there's better solutions out there. There's got to be. Um, of course there is. But I just there always don't. is. They just want to put a band aid. It's always a band aid on something. Let's uh, get rid of guns. Let's ban this. And they're just putting a band aid on the problem. And <laughs> well, like you said, and I think that even, I mean, you could say it, you could say it the same way. I mean, if they're going to address mental health, they're not going to address mental health because it makes too much money. Um, yeah, of course, drugs. And, Boom. Yeah. And the big pharma and everything, they pump a bunch of money into the government. And that's, that's been known for God knows how long, but the same goes, I mean, even right now with the whole pandemic and everything, you don't see anybody preaching the concept of, of working out, going to the gym, staying fit, eating healthy is all they're like. Oh, you got to get a donut if you get your vaccine. (laughs) Yeah. I I mean, don't get me wrong. The the whole pandemic and everything is, is, ruin a lot of people's lives and it's messing people up. And I know people that are younger that are still having like respiratory issues and everything from it. But at the same time, like there's, they need to preach the whole healthy habit thing. I mean, most gyms, I I know the gym that I go to here from my knowledge, hasn't had a case. And most gyms that have people who are healthy are not running into issues, but it's the people that are, pumping obese, mcdonald's into their yeah and diabetes are yeah those are the, uh-huh. and older and elderly the the yes. more susceptible <clears throat> right so it all comes down to money at that point so why would they expose the system with with health checks and everything if they're going for the whole gun situation so yeah. i don't know it it's sad that it happened i mean it's happened in colorado a few times and it's sad that the government and all sorts of people, they like instantly, I mean, you and I are like the most hated people in the world. We're like middle-class white guys. <laughs> and that's by far. Cis, one. Cisgender, cisgender, white male, uh, you know, just the <laughs> right down line. So we're, we're definitely racist. We support Trump. Okay. I grew up in New York. I'm sorry. Trump was an asshole in New York and he still is. I've never been a fan. That's just me. I knew the, I mean, I, he was always in the news and he hasn't changed. Yeah. So, I mean, just from that, well, like you said, I mean, I don't want to get the whole, but it's true. They look at it like we're white guys. So, you know, we're, we're, we've got an advantage. We're going to be uh Nazi or racist, all these things. It's like, come on, whatever. I mean, I went, I lived in the inner cities and everything for years. And, and I mean, if you get into the Trump thing, like I lived down in, in South Florida for a long time. And I had customers that work for him and they say he's an egotistical asshole and I believe it. Um, but the rest of them, like the family and everything that I've met, like they're great people. And, but the problem with the country then at the same time is they're all about, they don't pay attention to policy is all they care about is the, the person, the actual human being. Yeah. It's like, well, if his policies are killing America, then how can you even be happy? If you're going to sit no, there. He wasn't, he wasn't a bad president out. as far as he doesn't get credit for, the policies, what he enacted, but right. he just can't stay off Twitter and shit like that. <laughs> he just, you know, he shot himself in the foot. I mean, don't get me wrong. I don't know the guy. I just know when I grew up in New York, he was an asshole and I never was a fan, but at the same time, he wasn't a bad president. I mean, right. you know, the people want to think he was, but he wasn't a bad president. They're never good. I mean, they're all, it doesn't matter. Joe Biden, Donald <laughs> Trump, anyone, they're all politicians. End of story. Yeah, I, I would him. like to see if this whole um, what's his name down in Cruz down in Texas brought up the whole um, term limits. I would like to see if this actually passes because I can I can guarantee that everybody in America, if you were to put that on the ballot, it would pass with flying colors. They oh, yeah. want term limits. They want people. That's laughing. how it was. But, but it's never it's never in, on the ballots, and it's because the politicians don't want it there. And it's like well, it, well if you're working for never, the people, shouldn't you put it on the ballot? They were never meant to be full-time politicians it was it was a it was farmers that would come in for a little while they get elected do their business and go back and farm you know they weren't in washington year-round and now it's it's just ridiculous but anyways let's 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 talk about more fun things like hunting (laughs) and stuff we are going to talk so you so speaking of guns which do you prefer bow or gun or is it is it is it game dependent no i prefer uh archery now i'm a big time bow hunter and that probably changed a decade ago um because i I grew up with rifle i was always told or 
I mean, if you get back to where I like started hunting and everything, it was from my dad and my uncles. And they always talked about how difficult it was to shoot with a bow back when they were kids. And I mean, back then, who knows what they were actually shooting with. Um, <laughs> bows have come a long way since then. And so I was just firm on, on the rifle thing. And then I got into building long range things and I thought that was really cool. And then I shot a deer like 600 or some yards and I'm like, this is kind of boring now. Like I did it once. And so much can happen in the time that the, the round gets there. And I'm just like, so I turn to, to bow and I pretty much hunt everything with bow, no matter what time of year it is or season it is. And a lot of times it's any weapon season. I'll still take a bow out for the most part, but I might build another rifle just for fun and, and kind of do that for, I guess, different game animals. I, I'm going to have to carry one for wolves here shortly. And, um, because I'll be going, I'll be taking the horses in and going backpacking throughout most of the summer, chasing wolves, um, in certain areas that I know that they're really bad. Uh, and that, that I, if I get into a bow range of one of those, yeah, I'm a little nervous. So <laughs> look like you're very yeah. happy in the mountains whenever I see, I mean, <clears throat> it's nice for you to come down off the top mountaintop to do this podcast. <laughs> Cause anytime <laughs> I see your pictures, you look, you're somewhere all beautiful. And I'm just like, I'm sitting here in Texas it's hot, it's boring, and you're up there in the mountains. It's got some beautiful view, and it's just... Man, I used to live in Dallas. I don't know how that goes. Um, <clears throat> you know, and some people will... I guess some people don't know this, but when you go back to my old job of, of the door-to-door -door sales and everything like that, I didn't live in Idaho. I didn't even live out west, and so I never got to go in the mountains. Half of my like social media when I first started it was when I lived in Florida and then uh, Tennessee and Kentucky and Carolina, I think, and basically I would work my ass off like hundred, 110 hours a week running an office and trying to build a company and everything. And then I would save up enough to where I could get two weeks off a year and I would fly to Idaho. I'd go drop my bull, I'd butcher him. And then I'd fly back home. And that was the only time I got in the mountains. And so in about the last year and a half, since I've been back here, I try to get out and enjoy it a little bit more. I've, I used to be the big city life, um, bright lights, fast paced, everything. And now it's, I would just rather be without cell phone service. Actually, I'd rather go back to a landline in general. I mean, if we're going to get into it, but <laughs> can't do that running and operating businesses and, and doing those things. But it was you know, nice honestly. because you, you know, you don't have a chance to miss anyone. Like if you're in a relationship right now, cause they're always with you. They're always on that phone where it used to be like on a landline, you'd have to come home and see if your answer machine was blinking. Hey, I got a message. And then, you know, but now it's like, a, you're never disconnected. And it's, it's, yeah, I, I, I agree with you, man. It's, it's sometimes it's yeah. too much. It's a good and a bad thing too, because by never being disconnected, sometimes people are actually more disconnected than ever. Mm -hmm. Um, they live in this false reality and they don't pay attention to the people around them and they don't have the self-awareness to realize what's going on around them. Um, I mean, how many times I know people that they come home to their, their wife and kids and everything, or, I mean, the wife comes home or anything and they don't even talk for the most part. They sit there, they watch TV, they play on the phone and that's sure. it. They go to bed. And <clears throat> I think a lot of people have lost, touch of a lot of those things and every uh, and i think instagram social media and everything is good but then again it's bad because it, it does people are all after they're like 15 minutes of fame or that viral mm -hmm. video or anything like that and I, and it they give it so much attention that they just they can't pay attention to what's in front of them and i think it's being disconnected is actually or like actually disconnecting from that world and paying attention to what you have there is, is I think it's important and not enough people like actually do it, but, and it, that's the nice thing about going out and hunting. And, you know, I went through a bunch of, of rough times and some rough shit and, and it made me kind of realize the concept of, of like materialistic things don't really matter as much. And then when I got back into, uh, when I was able to go hunting the next time after I dealt with a bunch of that stuff, it uh, just being able to be present, and pay attention where I'm at and feel like, you know what? I'm lucky. It, this sucks. Like it's painful. I've got a 70 pound pack on. I'm 10 miles back here. It's like life is miserable, but at the same time, <laughs> you're like, people just don't get an opportunity to do that. Yeah. And so you have to kind of live in the moment and enjoy it and be like, well, 
I mean, yeah, it sucks, but at the same time, has anybody ever stepped foot in this place before? Has anybody I think ever that seen too this? sometimes. It's like, man, has anyone ever been here? Or like, I always think about sometimes I'll be someplace of like, did Native Americans like a hunting in this area they used to frequent or like, all, I always think about Buffalo because I always think of how many Buffalo used to be here. And I, mm-hmm. I always look out and imagine what it would have been like just seeing <clears throat> just across the prairies and everything. Yeah, that must have been incredible. I couldn't even imagine because you you always read about these big game animals that are taken back in like the fifties and sixties, and these monster bucks that people will just like shoot and leave the heads or the antlers. And I'm like, man, can you even? You don't get to see that today because there's such competition. I guess. I mean, it's good and bad, but um, shoot, you have all these you have a whole bunch of units in Idaho that are like two point only for deer and you don't get to see these like big monster bucks anymore. And, and some of those things. So yeah, what would it have been like back then? Um, <clears throat> one thing about this last year on my hunt in Wyoming, when I packed in with the horses, I found out afterwards, but the place that I decided to set up camp was about eight miles back. And it was this big, like open flat. And apparently when I got back, I had some like weird dreams and stuff. And I asked my buddy about it because he's a guy kind of out that way. And he told me that, yeah, that used to be, it's not really in the history books, but if you ask like the locals, it used to be like some sort of uh, sacred ground to Native Americans and stuff back then. And so they don't know, they don't know what went on, but <clears throat> apparently I was just like, that's where I was camped at. And it's just, they, they said there's all sorts of weird things that happen around there and there was a lake back there that somebody drowned in, I think a couple years ago and the body was submerged underwater for like 48 days. But most times bodies come up in like three days. And so you you have to wonder what, what in the world is back there? I mean, (laughs) how far do you usually go back? How far? I think it depends on the area. Um, I'm going to go into uh, out there. I was, it was about 10 to 12 miles on the average day um, oh. from, from my truck. So, but I was taking the horses back. Now, if I'm on foot, I'll go four to six miles and it depends on the heat and it depends on water and it depends on all that stuff. Cause I mean, I'm mostly primarily I'm an elk hunter. Um, I don't know why I just, I fell in love with it and that's kind of been my go-to Addicting. all the time. Yeah. It is. And I like different challenges and everything, but in September, sometimes it gets really hot. And, and if you drop something six miles back there and you're by yourself, chances are you're going to lose a bunch of that. So you have to pay attention to where you're at and be kind of self-conscious of those sort of things. So um, this year though, when I take the horses in, I'm going to go into one of the big wildernesses in Idaho. There's two of them. And I'll probably go anywhere from 20 to 25 miles back. It'd probably be a two day ride. Um, depending on where I can find them. I know that in the area, the elk populations are way down. And so I'm going to spend a lot of summer out there looking for them, but it's a lot of it is predators have kind of wiped them out and moved them out of there. And so it'll be, I think the first trip that I'm going in, in the beginning of June is 35 miles in and 35 miles back out. So just kind of checking things out and seeing what's going on, but do you run into I'm, any of those? Do you run into those, any of those predators? Do you ever see the wolf? I'm, I'm sure you see wolves, wild grizzlies. So in Idaho, well, Idaho is actually getting pretty bad. So I haven't run into a grizzly yet. And where I was at in Wyoming last year, there there aren't grizzlies um, yet. They're moving. Um, we did cut tracks in Idaho last summer that were way on the, the west coast of Idaho. And so they're moving around. They're going to come in. And as far as wolves go, I've really only seen two that I can think of. They're by far like the most difficult animal to hunt. And they're so smart and they can figure things out. I, um, Mm. I want to say it was like four or five years ago. I went in, I backpack in like six miles. And of course I get all the way back there and I set up camp and everything. I realized I left my sidearm at the truck. So it's just me, a bow and a hatchet. And I didn't think anything of it. And I think the first night I was walking into this like real small timber patch. And then some of the brush ahead of me, probably, I don't know, it wasn't more than 15 yards kind of moved. And then a wolf howled right there. And their howl is like the most bone chilling, just 
nightmare is what it is. <laughs> and it was right next to me. And there was probably, I don't know how many there was, at least four or five of them. They kind of yipped and barked and then they took off out of there. But I didn't see them. And they're smart enough to figure that out and can kind of hide and, and stay out of the way. But they're they're really bad here. And it's it's gotten to the point where a lot of the game animals are, I mean, we're losing them or they're staying in different areas. And, and uh, one area that I was in this year was I was chasing wolves around and, and the elk usually come down out of the snow. They come down to where there's like less than a foot of snow usually, but they've been staying up in two, three, four feet of snow just because it's easier for them to stay away from predators. And they, they're just doing so much damage. And I know that they're a problem in Idaho. Grizzlies are getting to the point where they need to be a problem. I was talking to the Sportsman's Alliance the other day, and they told me it's still probably three or four years before they get another grizzly tag open, which they're going to be all through the state. As soon as somebody dies in one of the major cities like Bozeman or Missoula or Boise or something from a from a grizzly, you'll start to see somebody like freak out about it. But that's what I'm going to be Unfortunately, going to. that's what's going to happen. <clears throat> Bozeman, the Bozeman area, hopefully. Depending on housing, it's kind of housing is kind of tight right now, and I'm hoping to find a place to live. If not, I'll go to Butte or something. I don't really have a committed. I just want to get the hell out of Texas. When are you trying to get out of there? I'm gonna. I've been in contact with a girl. Um, is it Lena Lena Mansur, uh, Perpetual Wander on Instagram? You follow her? I maybe. I don't know. Well, she's in she's in that area. She's originally from here in Texas, and we've been in touch and stuff. And she said to wait until Montana State gets out of uh, school, gets out. That way, there'll be places available. So, oh, as far as rent, yeah, uh, I just want to. I want to get a place for me and my dogs, and then eventually next year buy a house. And you know, I think so. I have calls, degrees in finance and accounting, and I. Um, I try and pay attention to the market swings and all that sort of fun stuff. And it, there's so many people upside down on their houses right now because of this whole like shutdown and everything. And, and they extended the whole foreclosure deal till June. Um, but I really don't think that the market's going to stay there. The market's going to just tank, I think yeah. pretty bad. Um, when you, when you learn a lot of the stuff that they tell you is, you know, if the market for a house, like the average house in an area can't, if it exceeds what the average income is per household, then you're, you're in for big time trouble. And I think I was just up in the Kalispell area and down in Missoula. And I think Kalispell, the, the average home is like 650,000, but it's like 400 the, something in Bozeman. Yeah. And it's, I think in those two areas, it's kind of like Boise where the average household income is like 60 grand and 60 grand, I think is maybe 300,000 is what they're what they can take on as far as a home pay. And so I think you're going to see something bad happen. And, you know, I was looking, cause I'm looking for a place. I was actually up there looking at housing and it's like to get out of Boise. And, uh, you know, for me and a little bit of land for like two horses was like four or five grand a month. <laughs> it's like, geez. Well, the problem they're so, having, cause <clears throat> I got my real estate license here and I'm working on getting mine from Montana. And the problem they're having is that they're getting an influx of people moving into like Bowie, Idaho and Montana from the West coast and the South. And they're literally dropping cash well over the market value of the house. And so they're driving all the housing price up. And like you said, the majority of people there don't have that income to survive. And now these houses prices are going well. Sure. If you had the house and now your market value has gone up, sell it. Cause you're going to make some money, but someone trying to buy a house and you got people coming in, jacking the price up a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars the market value. Yeah. It's like, well, I think doing everyone else. The, I, I want to say, and I was talking to my buddy Kevin the other day and he was telling me that when the bubble popped last time, there was like 3 million people that were, upside down in their house when the market crashed. And he told me that it was 10 million now. And when I went and looked at it, it's close to 11 million at this point, there's 11 million people upside down in the United States on their homes. And, but they just keep pushing this foreclosure thing out and not allowing banks to. And so what's going to happen is the market's going to, the market's going to tank people are everything's going to crash and the, the government's going to bail out the banks. And then the banks are going to repossess all the homes. Then they're going to resell them. 
and it's not the people that are going to get bailed out, unfortunately, but oh, of course not. It's uh, uh, that's, I mean, it's just going to happen. And unfortunately it's, and they want to call it a market correction. And I hate that term, but that's just kind of what they do. And so I think like me, I'm just kind of waiting it out at this point because I want to go up that way and move into either Wyoming or Montana or on in Eastern Idaho. Cause here in, in Boise, like really to get to the mountains, you still have to drive an hour and a half. Um, there's nothing really good, very close. I mean, there's a lot to do, but I would rather like step out my back door and be like 10 minutes from a trailhead or something. And the same way. it's, I, I love the smell of pine. <laughs> um, so a lot of the mountains out in this area, people don't realize that Boise is really a uh, dry desert and it's just kind of bland. And you come here in the summer and like everything's dead and brown and it's ugly and dust everywhere. But if you get a little bit farther North, everything's all pine and, and timber. And I don't know, it's just <clears throat> more comforting, I think to me, but. I was considering Wyoming for a bit there too. And then I'm single and there's not a lot of people and, you know, I've, <laughs> Their, their claim to fame is they have more pronghorn than they do people. And, yeah, I don't see myself fucking a pronghorn. So I'm gonna, <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll uh, go with Montana for, you know, tax wise, you know, one's got no income tax. The other one's got no sales tax. So they kind of balance out, I guess you could say so, but I'll go where there's more people. See, I did it. I did it the right way. So I have a business that is licensed and everything in Montana or not Montana in Wyoming. So I can actually put my, my personal address in or Wyoming nice. and then I can get in-state residency and tags there. And then I can have out-of-state residency wherever I want to go. You know, so. speaking of tags, <clears throat> that was another <laughs> deciding factor for me is I started comparing. Cause it, you know, I was, I was looking at Sheridan, Wyoming. That was one of the places I was <clears throat> considering. And then I started to compare cause they were both very attractive places, Montana and Wyoming. And I started to compare price tags for, uh, for hunting tax, and I was like, Montana's got the better deals. They've got, and they've got a little more, a few, well, a few more animals you can hunt. So, I'm going with Montana. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I haven't spent enough time in Montana. Like, I enjoy it, but the, I don't know. I just kind of have always had this. The West Coast or the Western side of of Wyoming has been a, uh, it's beautiful a place. I really like for a long time. Um, I've never been to Yellowstone people are kind of, I've never been either, yeah. crazy. but, <clears throat> and I don't like the Grizzlies. The grizzlies bother me, but at this point they're getting so overpopulated that they're going to be everywhere. So you're, you're going to have to deal with them one way or another. Um, same thing with the wolves and same thing with the, the mountain lions. But um, I don't know, to me, I just don't want to wait every three years to hunt in Wyoming. I just don't. Like I saw so many elk, so many bulls on a regular basis. Actually the bull that I shot, the whole herd damn near ran through camp. <laughs> I was sitting there with the horses. The horses were off like grazing and I was eating. And then I heard a bull bugle and I just kind of sat around and then he bugled again. And then a whole bunch of them bugled and they came like, they were, they were no more than like a couple hundred yards from my camp when they ran through. And I was like, Oh, okay. You call. And, and there was what you call, right? Do you call or stalk? I do. Um, I do, but people will probably find this crazy. Um, I haven't shot a bull that I've called in in probably like five years. Um, <clears throat> everybody just like has this thing about the like calling them in and everything, and it is a blast. I actually called I called the bull into ten feet last year, um, which was a trip. I had a friend there, Laura, and she was kind of like bright eyed at that point because he was so close, but I, I think I had like six different opportunities to shoot a bull that I called in on that hunt. And I ended up crawling into a herd and laying underneath a tree for like 45 minutes until a bull stepped up that I felt like shooting. Um, usually I hunt, I'll hunt the back half of September most of the time. And if they get into those big herds where it's the herd bull chasing off big bulls, they sit there and they scream and they yell all day and they don't pay attention. So as long as you can play the wind, you can just crawl right into them and take a shot. And that's what I've done for several years. Um, it is fun to call them in, but I've never been able to call one in, or I haven't called one in that's presented a shot to me that was, that I felt was big enough at the time. And I'm not an ego hunter at all. 
but usually that first like week is I'm going for antlers. <laughs> and then after that, I'm like, eh, you know what? I'll, I'll shoot, I'll shoot a raghorn. I don't care. But it's, uh, cause then I get tired and exhausted and run out of food or whatever else. But yeah, the monkey part is it's a blast. <clears throat> I think I haven't done a lot of, I haven't done like antelope hunting. I've been trying to draw a goat tag for years. Uh, I was supposed to go to Canada last year for a goat hunt and that all got shut down. They decided they don't want to let Americans in. So whatever. Um, but yeah, my, it's kind of hard. I haven't looked at Montana's like tag situation or anything. So I probably need to do that, but I'm, I've been more interested in hunting Wyoming than anything. Cause there's not nearly the, uh, there's not nearly the pressure yeah. The seasons are longer, um, and it's not as like restricted. I know Washington and Oregon now are so restricted on what you're allowed to hunt, how you can hunt. It's just difficult. So, yeah, I but. don't see my antenna. I don't know. I'm, I'm strictly bow. I'm gonna. I want to get into muzzle loading when I get out there. I want to put a build a gun and and do some muzzle loading rifle with uh Montana. But I'm like you. I'm strictly archery because. I like up close and personal, like you said, that 600 yard shot. I mean, no offense to people, but any knucklehead can pull the trigger on an animal at 300 yards. I mean, you know, but when you get them up close, like you said, you waited 45 minutes under a tree for the bull to present himself. And, you know, you're right there in a herd. Yeah. That, That's beautiful. That was fun. I, you know, I was so tired and so exhausted. I had actually ran out of food when I was eating that day and they ran through camp that was like my last meal basically. And I was going to hunt the next morning. I was going to skip that night's hunt and I was going to hunt the next morning. And then I was gonna back up and I was going to leave. I'd been in there for like 18 days. And then when they ran through camp, one of those, one of the herd bull was huge. Um, and so I, I kind of booked it and it was about two miles and I circled back around. I played the wind and I got in there and there was, I could see them and I saw the herd bull. He was at like 50 yards and he came, he came under 50 yards, like three other times, never gave me a shot. And I had a four point run through it, like maybe 15 yards, 10 or 15 yards. And then I had another bull come through underneath me at, at 10 yards and the cows and everything, they were at like 50. And then they just kept kind of feeding and feeding towards me while he was running off other bulls. I think there was like six in the herd. And then all of a sudden this bull came in from behind me. And he stopped and I thought he was at like 30 yards, but he was closer to like, I think he was like 18 and I, I saw he was a six point. So I stood up and I thought initially because I'm laying under a tree and my perspective is all skewed and everything. I had a cow at like 10 yards on the other side of it. And I stood up and realized that it was the wrong bull. It wasn't the herd bull, but I didn't have a choice. I had to shoot at that point. And I, I mean, I'm grateful for him. He dropped right there in the spot. He didn't go running off or anything, which is crazy. And then, come to find out the herd bull was on his way to take him out and like 50 yards away. That was kind of rough, but Oops. just to experience that lay and lay next to him and everything. And, and same thing with archery mule deer and stuff like you can get, you can get so close to those animals. It's a lot of fun. Um, especially in September when they're running around screaming and yelling and all that sort of fun jazz. Do you have a, a comfort zone as far as what yardage you'll take a shot at? usually yes um i'll take a shot like 60 62 and under on a on a bull is is generally my my cutoff range um <clears throat> for the first shot if i have to take a second shot like i'll probably span out to a little bit farther i'll i'll dial my bow into 120 usually and if i can if i can hit a paper plate like consistently like four out of five times at 90, I, I would take a 90 yard shot as a, as a second shot, but I won't take anything less than that. I think um, this bull, the big one, that guy, the full draw film tour bull, um, I shot him down the throat at 55 yards. So, which is a tight window, but if I feel really comfortable in my equipment and everything else and, and everything's dialed in, I'm a big speed guy. So as long as I have a, a heavy arrow, that's going fast then and I feel comfortable with it. I'll take the shot, but 
<clears throat> I'm a solo hunter also. And usually you don't get a shot. On, when you have somebody calling back behind you, they'll bring the bulls in closer and people will get a lot of shots at like 10 or 15 yards. But when you're solo, most of the time your shots, I don't think I've taken a shot under 35 until this year. Um, so most everything is between like 35 and 50. So, so do you, <clears throat> what you, you said you got a new bow coming today. What do you got coming in? So I used to shoot and people are going to like give me a hard time about it. And I don't really care. Um, <laughs> I'm one of those guys that likes, I like, if I like the brand, I like the product, then I'm going to shoot it. And I have what's called a, an APA King Cobra coming in. I, I I, APA, they're, those are nice. They're Canadian, right? Yes. APA? So they're, yeah. they're out of Canada. Um, people like to throw fits about it, whatever. Um, people are so, I don't know, they're, they're not very open in the, the archery industry. It's like these guys are Matthews guys, Hoyt guys, and, and that's it. Yep. And they want to sit there and yell and bicker back and forth. And I'm like, you know what? Like, uh, I'll go shoot this bow because I've shot it before. It's fast. Um, when I when I pull out the specs, it's kind of nuts. Um, I have 80 pound limbs and 29 inch draw, and I think the IBO on it's 371. I'm gonna be sending out 500 grain arrows at 325 feet per second, um, which is fast. And it's hard to dial in, but <clears throat> it's one of the things that draws me back to it is I I watched. I watched a bow, a limb break one time in the back country. And I lost, I watched like strings jump off a cam one time for another buddy of mine. And if you don't have a bow press close by for most of those bow companies, you can't do anything about it. You're screwed. And APA, I, I like the draw cycle on it. It's comfortable. It's lightweight. Um, there's not a lot of like vibration or anything in the shot. And there's not as much torque, especially with that speed of a bow, but also they have a little pin in it where it doesn't matter where you're at. You don't need a bow press to like fix it, replace the strings, do anything. Um, you can just stick a little pin in the cam and, and it'll release everything. And you can, you can even swap out strings and completely tune in your bow in the middle of the back country. So if you're going to be self-sustainable, especially in the way the world's going shit, <laughs> we might all just have to pack up and go to the back country anyways. So oh, it, I was looking at them. <laughs> Back in like 2012, I don't know how I found them, but yeah, they, they were fast back then. I remember the APA; yeah. they got really nice bows. And you don't hear much, like you said, everything here is Hoyt Matthews. I've shot, I had a Matthews, loved it, and then I got a Leak Cure, love that bow, and then I won a Hoyt through Elk Nut, and I love that bow too. I'm not a, yeah. I mean, they all have been great bows, and I right now I've got my Elite, and I use that for turkeys, which I was out this morning and fucker had hens and <laughs> you know I've, I've, never, I've never bothered to really hunt i think i hunted turkey like one time in north carolina and that was it i love it it's i don't know to me i just get bored and really know, it's a bird so i used to be a huge goose hunter and waterfowl guy and i think i just like I shot so many of them i know they're not turkey but the whole bird thing the only bird that actually sparks my interest as a chucker and that's because it tastes better than any other like game meat out there in my opinion most people will probably agree but the <clears throat> and yeah wild turkeys usually taste rough <laughs> and i'm a good cook but i love sometimes i always more. have problems with uh i don't you know i had uh scott laseth on here and he gave me some tips on because usually i just use the breast and he was telling me things yeah. to do with legs because legs are usually all skinny, there's ligaments and a <laughs> little bit of meat. But I don't know. I just yeah. love, and I hunt them with my bow, and I just love being out there. And like this morning, I spooked a couple of hens, and then he started gobbling. There were more hens, and then they flew down, and he flew away, and then came back, and he was like 80 yards, and he was hot, just going to the hens. And then I heard another <laughs> gobble, and I just love being out in the mornings, you know, like he. You talk about <clears throat> earlier when people don't get to experience those things. And I just love the early morning and birds waking up and you hear the songbirds and you hear a gobble and swear you saw a gray fox too. And just shit like that. You know, I wouldn't see here in my garage. Right. And you know, when I was doing that job for years and years before I kind of moved back, um, I used to tell these stories to, to people and I think I've probably posted about it a million times on 
my social media account, but the, I tell stories and you can see these people that have never left the inner city. They've never left, shoot, they've never left their own hometown. And they're just kind of like in shock and awe that all these places like exist and they want to see pictures and they want to see video or anything like that. And it's, and that kind of made me over the years start to think that, you know what, if, if, if I'm help, healthy enough and I kind of keep myself in shape and going and being able to experience those, get back in touch with like nature and, and the food and how to harvest and everything else. And even like gardening, even I, like, I don't do it very much now, but I've done it in the past just because I don't know, to be self-sufficient and, and to be able to experience everything um, I think is important. And, and so many people just sit there and they'll stare at their phone or their TV and they never get to see it. So it, uh, I've, I've, as I've gotten older, I've gotten to the point where I'm more about an experience over anything else. Like I don't have to have nice shit, but if I can go experience things and, and go live a life that way, then it's far better than sitting behind a TV and, and sitting on my couch when I come home from work or whatever. So, so how did hunting become pretty much, it's pretty much your job now. Like you get to pay the hunt, right? You get your sponsor at least, you know, I not anymore. Um, I used to be, and I talked about this on, on another show, I think. Um, so how I got into it was years ago when I was living in Florida, I saw that there was like a hunting fitness company basically that was going and they were doing pro staff stuff. And then I want to say first light was doing their pro staff stuff too. And at the same, and I was like, you know what, like, I go out there, I work hard, I shoot animals and I'm really pretty consistent. So I might as well like apply. And I got, I got to both positions. I think I was, I don't remember what it was with first light, but I got going with um, <clears throat> the one outfit for, for the fitness side of things and, and got more involved. And I was always, I'm always, I've always been like a very driven individual. So when I get involved in something, I kind of go for it. Um, Sometimes a little bit reckless, but hey, that's life. Um, <laughs> got to got to take risks sometimes. Take chances, anyway, right? And <clears throat> so I got to working with that company, and then because I was good at sales and and talking and everything like that, I started doing sponsorship contracts for that company. So I was calling. I think I think one day I called the. I think it was a Saturday afternoon or something like that. I called the the guy that was running the optics division for six hour on his cell phone. The dude's like, you got balls, man. <laughs> Cause I, I was just like, you know what? I got nothing to lose. So I might as well give it a shot. I ended up getting a really big contract for that one for them. And then I started doing it as a side job, helping some people get contracts and helping them get sponsored and, and all these other things. And I thought it was kind of cool. And social media at that time, I was starting to figure out what people wanted and how to grow your account and, those other things and and uh, at first it was a lot of fun and then I, I decided I, can't, I had this like business idea and this business plan and I, I wanted to kind of execute it and it had to deal with tying like the hunting industry into the fitness industry and the supplements and and one of the biggest things one of my biggest pet peeves is when you see like hunters and stuff they want to talk about or they brag about how they they're like they know where their meat comes from. They know where their food and everything comes from, but then sitting right there next to them is like a 64 ounce soda from Seven Eleven, or they're using a whole bunch of processed stuff as the rest of their sides for the plate. They're, they're talking about eating clean and eating organic and, and the food that they're eating, but then everything else is processed. And so I kind of took on that idea that I wanted to bring in that, the concept of, of, paying attention to everything that you eat and, and the health side of it and not dealing with all the, the over-processed stuff you pull out of the grocery store. And, and so then I, I started building another company, which I don't deal with anymore. And it, it went all right, but then we took on the whole TV contracts and the media contracts and stuff like that. And you know what? A lot of people, that's their dream. But for me, I don't necessarily, I, I, I thought it, it's cool. It's fun, but there's a lot of pressure involved when you get paid to hunt and everything. And that's why you see a lot of these big time hunters. Now they're, they're, they're ranch hunters 
they turn into ranch hunters because they're like, you know what, if I don't perform, if I go on public land and I don't knock something down, then it's going to make me look bad. And then my, my partners and my sponsors are going to be like, well, what the hell happened? It's like, well, shit, this is hunting. Like I'm hunting something. I'm not, sometimes you go home empty handed. I want to say like in the United States, only like 40% of all tags are filled period. And out West, it's even harder. Like I want to say it's only 10% of elk tags, like over the counter elk tags are filled every year. And there gets to be a lot of pressure and it got to the point where I wasn't even enjoying it. Um, to be honest. And because it's like, okay, I gotta, I gotta make sure to take photos. I'm a solo hunter. I gotta take video. I gotta take photos. I gotta shoot something. And I, it just became more stress and overwhelming than it should be. So I still work with brands. Um, but I'm not paid anymore, which is nice because then I can kind of pick and choose who I want. Well, just like me working with APA again, like I'll sponsor or, and promote them and work with them at trade shows or whatever they want, but I'm not asking anything um, because I don't want, I don't want that whole mess that, that comes of it, but it is tied to other stuff that I do. So I do have some product lines that'll come out and I'm working on opening up a gym a warehouse space in the Boise area um, that will be, I mean, it's basically an outdoor based gym. So you'll have an archery range with it and it's the equipment that'll be in there. I have some custom made packs that we're going through and some other products that'll be tailor made to, to hunting because probably one of the biggest complaints of guides and outfitters is that they have a bunch of hunters show up out of shape and not willing to do the work. And yeah. then they get pissed off at the guide when they don't shoot anything. It's like, well, shit, your fat ass couldn't get up the hill (laughs) so it's so i wanted to be able to kind of develop that side of things and it's where i was going with the other company but it it just wasn't going to work with the guy that i was working with so i kind of had to rearrange things and and move on but that's better for the whole mental health life than it was anything if we want to circle back to that but (laughs) So that's the Bill um, Athletics. That's your Bill Athletics. That's what that is. So Bill Athletics is primarily that's just a that's a retail web based platform. So I sell a bunch of different brands on there and products that are people that support the industry. Um, there's I probably have five that I need to put on there, but I haven't. I've been kind of behind on a lot of things lately. But there's I have a, a my own like product lines and everything. They'll be launching here shortly, um, and then those will all tie into the gym as well. So it's, it, uh, <clears throat> there'll be different, there'll be actual, like from a supplement line all the way down to different gear that people can use for training and, and everything else to go through. Well, I don't even know if they're doing train to hunt anymore, but um, that whole concept is kind of tying them in. And <clears throat> I'm getting involved with like the Spartan races and a couple of different archery shoots and some of those things. So it, um, it should be good. It, there, there's a need for it in the industry. Um, especially now that people are wanting to get out a lot more and they want to hunt these social media is, I used to put in, well, I used to put in for a mountain go hunt all the time in Idaho and they're used to, they give out four tags and there'd be like 30 or 40 people put in for a max. And then now since social media has taken off, I mm-hmm. think like usually there's two or 300 people put in for it and it's yeah. impossible to draw a damn tag. But I mean, usually every year people get lazy over the winter time and then they find out they draw tags in May or June and they're like, Oh shit, I got to get in shape. And everything kind of sparked or like peaks over the summer and people are getting ready for different hunts and, and even deal or, and even making connections with like Heather, Heather's choice. And she, she has some great products and, and meals that are supposed that to come on here. here. She has, she's supposed to come on here, but we've been in touch. Oh, nice. I love Heather. <laughs> she's a blast. I'm supposed to go up there at some point in time and, and hang out and she'll probably put me to work though. She's a slave driver. Um, yeah. She looks pretty but, fit. I've seen yeah, her. She, she looks pretty fit. Yeah, She's hyperactive with, with her work and she's passionate about it, which I love. And, and, but her products are, are meant for, I mean, clean pack, a lot of calories, um, mm. lightweight. She knows what she's doing. Um, yeah. but I work with her and, and some of the other brands to, to make sure that there's everything that, that hunters and outdoorsmen and people that go on like adventures and backpacking trips and everything are, they need. So it's, it's a huge industry if you really tie them all in together. But unfortunately there's so many people that hate hunters 
that hate the concept of it, then you have to be careful with it. And I don't know, it gets in the whole, I don't know, PETA mental struggle thing again. So, well, and it's a, you know, it's more their urban lifestyle or they're so disconnected. You know, we don't have that connection with nature anymore like we used to. So there, yeah, right. you get, but then, you know, and the ones that are open-minded and understand and they don't judge you, you know, the vegans who are going to dead set, you're an animal killer and you're, you, you just are a murderer. And it's like, come on, whatever. So the, you know, sometimes you've got to pick and choose your battles and who you can convince. And do you ever have people on your social media give you shit about when you post something, you don't really post a whole lot with animals. You post more like the experience. Do you get ever get shit from people? I used to, um, I don't post as much with the animals and everything. And usually it's because I'm by myself and it, you got to get in there and clean up the animal. Like my hands are bloody. I'm not going to get myself. Yeah. Out. Shit. Um, <laughs> but I also don't like to use the word kill. I prefer like harvest for some reason. Yeah. It's just kind of a, my own personal opinion, but I used to get a lot of death threats. Um, I think I some of, social media is kind of toned down somewhat. I want to, I actually feel bad for the female hunters that are bigger on site. They don't even have to be bigger. If they got 500 followers, they get more death threats than I ever did. Um, I don't know if it's the beard or that I lift weights or what people are intimidated <laughs> or shit, but <laughs> like females, they, women in the hunting industry, they, they get blasted so bad. I feel bad. Um, but yeah, I used to, and then Instagram suspended me one time for uh, like three weeks because some guy messaged my, my account and said that he was going to kill me. He was going to kill my dogs and my family and stuff. It was, he was a nice guy. And, uh, <laughs> so they suspended you. <clears throat> they did. Well, so my reply back to the guy was, um, I said, hey, do you think it's smart to, to threaten somebody who kills things with a stick and string for a living? And he reported me to Instagram, said it was a death threat, and <laughs> they suspended my account. Yeah, um, he can threaten you. Okay, makes sense. Yeah. I mean, yeah, if you went through the conversation, he was threatening to kill my family, my dogs, myself, and and all sorts of stuff. And it's like, I, and I didn't threaten the guy. I just said, hey, like, I do this for a living. Like, is that really, <laughs> have you even been outside of the city before? Like, exactly. I don't know. And yeah, Instagram suspended my account for like three weeks. So since then, though, I haven't really had very many like death threats for the most part. People, I have a lot of people that follow me who aren't hunters or in everything else. And I think it's more or less because I, I'm not I actually have a story that I was going to post today. I'm not necessarily a highlight real guy. Like, man, if life sucks and life is tough, I'll post about it because I'm not the only one going through that shit. Yep. Um, and even, even when times are good, I, I go through and I scroll through different poems and stuff that people write or inspirational stuff. And I post about it because it's things that sometimes people need to hear. You know how many times I've been told, like, thank you by people just because they're uh, of something that they're going through that day, or maybe they didn't want to get out of bed that day. And they're like, you know what? Like, I appreciate it. And at first I had a hard time with it, but over the years, it's kind of, if I can reach and help somebody, then I, I'm all for it. Like I'll post it and I'll stay on there. Cause I really don't like the big account. I don't like social media that much. I prefer, like I said, I prefer to go back to the landline, but if I'm going to have it, I might as well like use it to help people. Um, <clears throat> and it, it, it doesn't even have to be in the hunting industry. It could just be in life in general. I mean, if people are having a hard time, like, shit, I've listened to some, like a lot of people that are going through God knows what, um, and one of these days I'll probably get on somebody's podcast and tell the story of everything that I kind of went through, but it, uh, I mean, shit, you've had it rough too in recent years and recent times. It's, it sucks to go through that stuff, but you're not the only you one. Got, you got to play the and cards so, you've been dealt. And, you know, people, people get so caught up in, like I had said earlier, false reality. They think that everything is like perfect on these other people's lives and it's not. Yep. Um, and I think, that probably play I, I would love to know how much that actually plays into the mental health thing if you want to swing back to the concept of the shooter and all that other stuff like they think that their lives suck so bad because what they see on social media or what they see everybody else around them are buying these things and, and did you watch 
oh, you don't have TV or cable stuff. There's <laughs> HBO Max had a thing called. Uh, it had something to do with like instant fame on in on Instagram. They took these three or four people, and they were gonna. Their goal was to make them famous on Instagram, and so they were buying them followers, and they they would take. Like you're talking about, people see these images and stuff. They they took a toilet seat and they put it up. They have, dude, they have studios where people could go rent out, and it's like the inside of a jet. And people will take pictures, act like they're living this plush lifestyle, on a, and it's it's a studio. But what they did is they took the, they had the girl looking out the window, and then they took a toilet seat and they put it up against the window, and she's looking out as if she's drinking wine. And just looking out of, a, out of a jet, it was a toilet seat in a window. But they just wanted, and they presented it and posted it, and it looked like she was looking out on a private jet, drinking some champagne, and it was all, yeah. So, yeah, you're right. I mean, they, people see these Kardashians. Yeah, they're a different breed, but <laughs> people got these these false realities they get from social media. They, you know, I used to do a lot of traveling and everything like that, and and traveling to some of these big national parks and everything nowadays is not what it used to be because people just show up and they go on these like little adventure hikes and they're down and stuff from REI and they never even get like five feet off the trail ever. <laughs> and cause all they do is they go to like the prettiest place that they've seen on social media and they take a picture of themselves yep. standing there. And I mean, I'm cute and everything, but I don't need that many pictures of myself um, <laughs> for everybody to see. <laughs> and um, it, you know, and it, it's like, that's why people that's that's all they do and they they present like oh i'm a world traveler and everything else like that it's like i i, I don't see it i don't see how the hell are you gonna do that if you got five thousand followers um and it's i can't even imagine what people will do to make like certain videos and certain posts and i mean i i know that there's been guys that, that get out of the truck and they walk like 10 feet from the truck and that's where they'll take their picture at it looks cool and um, <clears throat> yeah, it just, and everybody gets to the point where they're like, God, I wish I had that life. Yeah. And I wish I had that. And I wish I had this. And I mean, I'm not going to lie. I had a point in time in my life where I would look around and be like, shit, I want a new, I want new this. I want this. I want the bigger house. I want these fancy things. And it's, it, when you get caught up in that lifestyle, it's kind of a, it messes with your brain. Cause then you're like, well, what do I, what am I doing wrong? If I can't have that or I can't go these places or I can't see these things or is that person really like, I don't know. People get so caught up in the, the concept of maybe that somebody else is like, grass is always greener. There you go. Yep. Um, and it, they don't, I mean, it, of course the neighbor's grass is going to be greener if he's the one like paying attention to it and feeding it fertilizer and everything else. If you don't do shit to your yard. So it's, uh, I don't know. It's tough. And I, I wish I would see that though, just because, because <laughs> it does sound ridiculous that people are doing that kind of stuff, but yep. yeah, they got one they girl. Do. She got, she got <clears throat> really big off it and she was very down. Like she didn't let it get to her, but she started getting packages in the mail from these people that wanted her to just like, she got to think for a bidet. People paid her to, to put it, install a bidet. And then she posted a video of her using the bidet and she got paid for it. And it's like, wow. But you know, you, know, you talked about earlier about being present. That's the, that's the whole deal. Just live in your moment and don't worry about, I don't know. It's hard to, it's easy to say, but people just nowadays want to live these little fancy lives because they see other people with a lot of followers doing it. And they think that's just how to, how, how life is. And it's not, it's not all. And you know, it's, and it is hard. It's hard to like go to work and everything. And you bust your ass all day and then you come home and you have to give time to the family and be present in that situation and everything like that. Like, I don't know. I was, I'm single now, but I was in a very long-term relationship for a long time. And it you know, like being able to, to always be there and to always like give it attention is, I mean, you lose track of it sometimes you just do. Um, and with social media and the way that that phones and TV and the internet and everything is, I guess it's probably easier and people, and I guess on Instagram's worse, but I don't pay attention to Facebook. I hate Facebook, but yeah, I don't. Instagram's worse about the whole, like these people have like great lives. But then if you go on to Facebook, it's like 
is all people are doing is bitching. So it's like, well, which direction am I going to go here? And then Twitter, <laughs> they should call Twitter snitch because that's all it seems yeah. like anything comes out of <laughs> Twitter. People snitching on you. Hey, look at he posted something twenty years ago. Let's get him. Oh yeah, wow. I can't. I can't keep up with all this stuff. I'm too old for that shit, man. Um, you be both. About, you need to do TikTok and everything. I'm like, who the oh, hell has God. time for that stuff? Like, I'd rather go to the gym and spend my time in the gym and trying to find a way to get better. And and no offense to the podcast thing. Like, I don't listen to podcasts for the most part because I'm. You know, I'd rather read. I'd rather study on something or find a way to do something that that is progressive um now sometimes they're great because they, they give you a perspective that maybe you haven't heard of before and everything else like that and i i have listened to a few um but for the most part i'm not like a i'm not even like a consistent music listener because i feel like i get distracted um i try and give all my attention to to doing things and making sure that i'm out there like trying to figure it out like Shit, I'm, wor I'm working overtime for the most part this week, so Friday I can go out and try and chase bulls at wall. I'm not going to chase them around. I'm going to go look for sheds again. They haven't been dropping. so. But <clears throat> trying to get back in there and, and get away from the world for a little bit and pay attention to where I'm at. And I think I posted a story from last weekend because it was snowing and hailing, and I'm like, man, this kind of sucks. But at the same time, it's better than sitting behind a fucking desk. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's the, that's the one thing I'm looking forward to being back in the mountains is just to get away, you know, whether it's shed hunting or fly fishing or just something. Cause here there's no public land, in Texas. There's right. none. You, you know, the, with the West coast or the West portion. Yeah. There, way, way far, way far South. There's a, there's a, there's one piece of national, uh, public land, um, way near the border and whatever i'm not going to go all the way down five hours just to spend a weekend on i don't know it's right. but <clears throat> i just want to be able to get out and go to the mountains and like you said get away you won't have cell phone service you don't have to worry about shit and just enjoy man i miss that so much i i absolutely miss all that stuff and i don't think people realize like because you can get remote and like some of the other states and and whatnot but i don't think people realize like how remote you can actually be yeah um there's well for instance the one trip that i have coming up is is in the frank church wilderness in idaho and that's got that's 2.4 million acres without a road nice. there's no road and it's <laughs> you can get in there by plane or boat or horseback and you know, there's not going to be any cell phone service. I don't have to talk to anybody. And, and it's, it's kind of nice. It's, it's simple. And I think if more people got back to the concept of a simple life, sometimes it would, it would do a lot of good for everybody. But um, I, I enjoy it. The only problem I have is coming back to society after two weeks in the mountains and having to pick back up the pace and realize that a different what world exists. Cause I mean, right. you don't know anything. I mean, shit, can you imagine what this whole like pandemic and everything would have done if there was no, there was no news, there was no TV, there was no nothing. I mean, and people just paid attention to what was going on. Like, I don't think there would be mass hysteria, but you never know. It's uh, I don't know. Getting back in touch with like nature and, and getting away and getting to breathe fresh air and everything else is good for, it's good for the soul. It just is. Yes. <clears throat> it's, totally. Uh, you get down there in Texas where it's 125 degrees for 12 Six months. months. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then you get, you get like one ice storm the world shuts down and then, uh, then it's back to 90. So yeah, I pretty I did, much how it was. <laughs> Seriously. I didn't mind Texas too much. It was just Dallas is built bad. It's not a good place, but, um, I don't know. And you can still experience those things in some of those other places. I, I've been in some remote wilderness out in um, like Tennessee and out in uh, the Carolinas is nice. And I don't know if I didn't live in the mountains, I would probably move to some Island somewhere and just kind of disappear anyways, just because it's just refreshing. <laughs> I, I don't know if I could, I don't know if I, I'm not a beach guy. I don't think really? I an Island. Yeah. You know, I was actually more of a beach bum than the mountains. I didn't think I'd ever come back, to be honest with you. Really? Um, yeah, I was 
uh, one of the places I very first went to when I moved away, I moved to Atlanta and then I was living in Kentucky for a little bit. And then I moved to Miami, Florida by myself when I was a kid, but just, I was like 19 fake ID. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I couldn't wait to get back. I was only there for like six months and then I moved back to Florida and you know, I, I loved it, but it was more, the vacations and the trips out to the Caribbean where you can be on these little tiny islands that really don't have anything industrial. And they're kind of, I mean, there's a, there's a maybe a little grocery store or something in town and it, it's, it's just back to the simple life. And I like the whole spear fishing concept and, and uh, seafood. I love seafood. And I do love seafood. Love, but, yeah. There's not a whole lot of great <clears throat> sushi out in the mountains. <laughs> But I, I don't like freshwater fish either. That's I'm not a big like freshwater fish guy. So I I would I need to get back into to fly fishing because I haven't done it in a long time. But um, to me, it was I spend more time like chasing animals, hunting than I do. I have this like predator drive, I guess you could say that when I get in the mountains, I feel like I should be hunting something. And so it's it uh, good and bad. Whenever I go out, I always bring my fly rod, but I never use it because I'm like, you. Yeah, I'm always out. It's like I, I have these intentions and I never just, I don't have time because I want to be out chasing animals. And it's, yeah. it's nice. I have the, I, I mean, when I have the time to fly fish, I enjoy it. I love that sound of the running water. And it's just, for me, it's, it's a relaxing experience. It's very, very nice. And you see the trout rising and trying to catch yeah. them. I enjoy that. Yeah, I need to go do it a little bit more. And I think now with the horses and I have the two draft horses that I'll be, I'll go back and pack in and, and do some of those more remote trips. Cause I don't know. It seems like the older I get, the farther I want to get away from people. <laughs> Unfortunately. Way. Um, I don't get me wrong. Like I like helping people. I like to be around and be social and everything, but at the same time, it's like, it's kind of nice to, to escape a little bit. Yeah. Um, I'm not, I can turn it on when I have to, but yeah, I'd rather, I have no problem being by myself out in the mountains, out in the woods, just relax and just taking it all in. I have zero problem with that. The, uh, one, well, I think it, it does get you from a mental health standpoint. Again, it gets you back into the, it's refreshing. I think. And nowadays the only way that they want to like con do anything with mental health is, is pump people full of medication. And I think that's, yeah one of maybe the issues and you know one of the things that's, <laughs> it's i shouldn't laugh but you know if you, you ever see any of those commercials about antidepressants or anything like that it always talks about one of the side effects down there is like suicidal thoughts on, on yeah. every single medication it's, it's like, like the, you know oh, what? what the fuck i'm trying to not do this and now you give me something that i possibly could and i think and maybe and it's like how is that going to be one of the the possible side effects if if um I mean, just everything in general, when we get back to the, the whole shooter and the guns and, and everything, it's, I don't know, clean, like healthy living, I guess, is, is what we need to get back to. And less people being, people are so manipulated and everything by that, by the media and the news. And it's what it is. Yeah. I, I can't wait for hunting season again. And I have, I'm not, I don't even have a hunt until actually I'm going out and, june and then i'm going out in july and then i'll have my september hunts and then you don't hunt bear um well yes yeah, so i'll go out probably at the end of may june and when i pack in i'm primarily gonna hunt wolves though um okay. if i see a bear i'll shoot it but i'm i'm not big on the bait thing a lot of people yeah. like to run baits and i'll do spot and stock shoot with a rifle um but to me, it's more predator control. And I'm, I guess that's why people are shooting bears for the most part, but wolves have gotten so bad in, in some of these areas in Idaho and in uh, Montana and stuff that, and well, and actually both of the wilderness areas in Idaho, um, Idaho just like passed a law where they made wolf hunting year round. There's no seasons for it anymore. And in a lot of areas, you don't even have to, I think it's going to pass where you don't even have to have tags. They're just considering them like coyotes and go out and shoot them if you can find them. But the, uh, in the wilderness areas, you still have to have tags and everything, but they got sued a few years ago where they're not allowed to take helicopters in anymore and they can't pay government trappers to go in and take them out anymore. So basically they're, 
the only way that to, to stop the wolves from basically destroying everything is hunters have to go in and do it. And that's some of the most difficult, brutal, nasty, ugly terrain in the United States, like period. And so if, if I might as well go try and do it. Plus you have organizations that are out there that are, they're paying people now to try and if they shoot a wolf, like you get paid, I think the one group pays 500 to a thousand bucks a head. If you can put them down because they're so bad. They're, they're caught. I mean, I respect the animal and everything that they can do because they're, they're the apex predator period, but they need to be controlled. And if government can't control them, then somebody else has to do it. And I don't know, it just seems like a challenge to me. So why the hell not? <laughs> Sounds fun. I would, yeah. I wonder what kind of, cause Corey Jacobson was talking about, he got one and he got just a shit ton of people attacking them. And it's like, they don't understand. Oh, I'll, get, they, they, I'll get slaughtered for it. Yeah. Cause the wolves, they I'm think sure. there's this mystical feeling behind them. I guess you could say, cause, but they're, they're a killer. <laughs> and what you said, apex predator. I mean, that is like, that is their job is to kill and they can devastate a population of animals. They can. And, and most people don't. I mean, if you went in and looked at the, the Yellowstone elk numbers from before they introduced the wolf to after it's bad. Like it's like an 80% drop or some crazy thing. Um, and that's primarily due to the wolves because people aren't hunting them in there. It's not, I mean, you can't go into Yellowstone and shoot a, a, an elk. So it's, that's just the wolves are doing the damage. The same thing goes to both of the wildernesses in Idaho that you can't take that are those massive wildernesses, both the, the, the calf and the bull population is so far down that it, they're limiting tags now to hunters because wolves are just slaughtering everything. And people don't realize like how, how big they are. I mean, they only put, I want to say they only released like 35 in Idaho in 1997 and now there's over a couple thousand and if people want to say oh you, you can't shoot them or i don't know they're they do they think that they're like some unicorn type animal i guess and and you shouldn't you shouldn't be allowed to touch them and i don't think that they don't realize the damage that they do and and um <clears throat> especially to cattle like ranchers and everything have to deal with that stuff. And that's more government money that we have to shell out more tax dollars. They go to pay to, to something that just got slaughtered in the ranch. And I could, I, I wish I knew the numbers on that one. I don't off the top of my head, but there's a ton that get killed every year from, from wolves. And I, I probably need to go on and look at what Corey had to go through, but it's uh, <clears throat> wolves are always a hot topic and people think that, the dogs. I they think know. they're like a dog. Oh yeah, like the meanest damn dog on the planet. <laughs> you know, I, yeah. I think the best the best representation to show you how far apart domestic dogs and wolves are is do you have you seen that video? It was nighttime, there was snow on the ground, there were two domestic yeah, dogs that and that and that pack of wolves, and then the two dogs had, thought they had balls and they were just yeah. swallowed up like boom. And this is going oh, to yeah. show you wolves. That's that's the distinction between a domestic dog and wolves. Is watch that video and realize they're killers. And they're huge. Um, people don't realize how big they are. Some of these wolves yeah. are close to two hundred pounds. I mean, that's bigger than in, like I don't know. Some people have seen like a Malamute in person, and I mean that might be close to a two hundred pound dog sometimes. But in you know, I don't think, and one concept, and I probably won't be liked in the hunting industry for this one, but I don't think the wolves are, they are killers, but I don't think that they're killing for sport. I don't mm -hmm. think that they kill for fun. And that's a common thing that, that, that's a common defense that hunters are trying to use is, well, no, they go, they, they slaughter these animals and everything for fun. They do, they kill, I've, I've come across wolf kills where they did not. They come back. They killed the animal and left it. No, they didn't come back. Like this was, it was just decaying. So they kill it and they leave it and everything. But I, I honestly, I think it's more of a training. They're training pups and they're training everything else. And I mean, I had a, you're not going to be good at it. You're not going to be good at something if you don't practice. Yeah. And I had a uh, sport biologist from Montana. And we talked about that. I asked her about the, uh, those type of killings. And she said that they do do it 
but other animals benefit from it. And I think she says sometimes oh, they get caught, they get caught up in the kill. They may be killing, you know, there'd be a herd of elk and they get so caught up. They may kill more than one animal just because mm-hmm. they're in that kill mode. But she says there's other animals that will benefit from, you know, it's, oh, yeah. it's, it's sad that they got, you know, it's devastating to a population, but it's, I mean, it's not going to waste. There was a, um, I wish, I wish I had an opportunity to stop on the side of the road where I was at when I was driving up to Kalispell a couple weekends ago. Um, there was an elk on the side of the road. He was on the other side of the water that was dead. And I don't, the whole herd had come running down off the mountain. So I don't know how it died. I didn't get a chance to stop and look at it, but there was the eagles sitting on top of that kill. And that kill wasn't, that was like, it was fairly fresh. I don't know. I don't know how it died, but if, whether it would be a cat or wolves or something like that running through there, but there are a lot of birds and everything else that that's how they survive. They see those dead kills and, and something like that's huge, especially during the middle of the winter when the snow is six feet tall. So, yeah, I, I don't know. I still think a lot of it is training where, I mean, you have pups and everything that they have to learn how to hunt. And I mean, shit, it's in every damn Disney movie you can ever think of. They're Killer whales do, do it. <clears throat> have you ever seen? Have you ever seen killer whales train their their uh the yeah. with the seals and they they play fucking volleyball with them. They smack around and and show them how to kill yeah. the animal. It's yeah, they they do it. Killer whales teach their young like just for training. They just yep. take an animal and kill it, just like everything else. But I don't know. It's <clears throat> it's interesting. I, I've I've spent a little bit of time hunting them, so it'll be it'll be good to get a lot better perspective and point of view on them and, and be around them a little bit more because they're shit. They're so hard. And that was, people are talking about how they, they slaughtered 30% of the wolf population in, in Wisconsin. No, they didn't. There's no way that you kill that many that fast. You just don't. There might be 500 no, that go down. <clears throat> I don't want to eat. You're the third hunter I've had on here. Who's hunted wolves. And all of you said they're wicked hard and they're super smart. So, they i've like i've been i've heard them i've been in range of them and never been able to see them and they're talking back and forth and they'll circle back behind you everything else they're not like a bear like shit i've had bear walk up i had a bear try to get into my path one time like 10 feet away and they don't care but wolves are they stay out of sight they know what they're doing i mean there's you can find wolves right now 20 minutes from the city of boise and like you can find tracks and everything, but nobody, you never see it on the news that people are having sight of them. They're not running around. They're not out in the open. So I don't know. They're, they're, they're interesting. I, I would, I want one personally for the rug, but <laughs> <laughs> other than that, it's, it also is a, you know, if you can help out some sort of a population at that point, I, the state of Idaho is trying to drop them. They say there's about 1500. I think they're full of shit. I think there's a few thousand and they want to drop it down to less than 500 in the state because they just can't manage them. They've gotten out of control. So, and then Colorado thinks it's a good idea to bring them in. You know, I, I think, well, there, here's your Colorado thing again. Like <clears throat> you're not going to find elk running around in Estes park anymore. They're going to be gone. You know, it's People funny you mentioned that <clears throat> because Julie, the biologist from Montana, we were talking about that. And she said, she mentioned Estes Park, Rocky Mountain National Park. And she said, if they introduce wolves there, those animals be like, they'll have no clue what just hit them. They're, they're you know, they're going to have a field day. It And it takes years for the elk to figure out how to run and operate. And they, yep. they act completely different. So from one year, well, I'll give you an example from one year to the next in an area that I had hunted, they like, we used to catch elk on top, which was like at 8,000 feet and everything. And then all of a sudden it was like overnight the next year, we couldn't find anything. You had to dive down from, cause you hunt off at the top and you come from 8,000, you were having to drop all the way to like 4,000 feet to get to elk. And, and I had no idea what was going on. Well, after the season, actually it was when I shot that, the six by seven there, I, I talked to the fishing game and everything. They said, yeah, there's a pack of wolves that came in there and elk weren't talking during the middle of the day. They'd only talk at night and they act completely differently. They, they do things different. Their patterns are different. How they run and operate is, is way different. And 
if they don't know how to like defend themselves or they don't know how to like run and operate like that, like in Estes park and the national parks and everything in Colorado, they're just going to get slaughtered. And then people are going to be upset there because I mean, think of all the tourism dollars that come into those towns. Yep. And especially Estes park. I'll oh yeah. Freaking go right into town there. They live right in the park. <laughs> there. That's a gorgeous place. I've been up there and it's just like, you know what? It's sad to think that even the deer and everything, they're going to disappear. People are going to wonder what happened. It's like, well, you brought a wolf in. And you're yeah. never going to see the wolves because they're not going to be out in the open. But then you mentioned killing the wolves, and then they'll be like, oh, you can't do that. It's like, <laughs> make up your mind. You know, I said a few years back, I did a podcast, and I, I said I really didn't think – I mean, it probably goes to, to stem from a lot of things. Like, people need to pass a test or whatever to be able to to vote on these things. But I said something about a, a guy that's never been out in the wilderness that's like stay at home with a man bun probably shouldn't be voting on what happens out in the wilderness. If he's never been out there, he doesn't know what they're going right. to do. Right. And I mean, Grant, I probably take that statement back a little bit uh, because people can be educated about it if they, if they look in the right direction, but they need to actually do the research before they can take a vote on it. Um, and it's, or have the actual science backed. I don't know. There's a video that I've sent around to some people that is like how wolves change rivers. And it's the most far leftist thing that you could ever dream of. And it's just, it, it's not true. It, it has nothing to do with it. And, and um, they're talking about how they, how they wipe out populations of, of animals that are doing so much damage to the ecosystem that it allows like rivers to come back to life and everything. I'm like, no rivers have to do with like snowpack and, and uh, I don't, yeah, I don't know. It's a, <laughs> it's probably the most ridiculous video you've ever seen. If you haven't seen it yet. But, I haven't seen it. I'll send it to you. It's <laughs> please do. I, I would. I would love to you're be entertained. Uh, um, you're you're probably going to get mad. You're the hell is this? Um, but I've sent it around recently. It's, it's pretty. It's it's stupid. Um, it's a very one sided argument. Let's put it that way. And <clears throat> you know, I look at both sides of things. Like I don't mind wolves being here, but at the same time, if they're not allowed to be managed properly, yeah, then that's what sucks. And, and it goes for anything. It even goes for like fishing. It, when people introduce certain types of fish to try and manage the population of the native fish in there or something like that. And then all of a sudden it's, they wiped them all out. It's like, well, what the hell did you think was going to happen? Um, I, I know there's some, there's some lakes in Idaho and everything where they introduce musky to try and like thin things out because they're overpopulated with something else. And then all of a sudden they're like, oh, the only thing that's left here is musky. Well, of course. Yeah, I wonder why. Because they hunt. <laughs> they're hunters. Yeah. Duh. And so it's, I don't know. Some of that stuff kind of bothers me. And I don't, you know, and, and just like, just like with the guns and just like with COVID and just like with everything else, some people would just rather have the government make all their decisions for them. And yeah. I learned that a lot when I was in the, the inner cities and when I was working in the door to door job and everything like that, like there's so many people that cheat the system. Like it's the most disgusting thing on the planet. Um, I've seen people that they turn their garage into a half address and that's where the, the boyfriend lives. So that way the, the wife can have, can claim a single mother home. And so she gets more of a, a break. She gets more, benefits she doesn't have to go to work and when people are making 70 or eighty thousand dollars a year sitting on a couch shit i mean if they and they're gonna say yeah the government can go make all the decisions that they want they can do whatever they want because i mean i'm living happy and it's and they don't have to do anything and that's i don't know some people just they don't want to fend for themselves they don't they want to be told what to do and it's yeah it's just life wolves and sheep and then we come back to wolves again. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, listen, hey Jeff, thanks for coming on. I got a, I got the Seattle yeah. Kraken strength conditioning coach coming on at one o'clock here, and oh nice. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta take a wicked piss. <laughs> <laughs> My bad, dude. Yeah, no, I no worries. I yeah, I, 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 and do some other. Stuff, I, re so. I really appreciate you coming on. I'm glad you took the time out. I wanted to get to meet you and stuff. Besides seeing all those pictures, and you know, you do put up inspiring, inspiring words too. And you're, you're not all show. You have some meaning behind the stuff you do. So <sighs> somehow I, I learned to write somewhere, and I don't know. I wasn't a good writer back in the day, but somehow well, it came into play. And 
you connect, like you said, you connect with people and plus you get the, your experience and stuff and you're sharing that. And that's the cool part. You're not just like, look at, I shot this. You're out there. It's more than, you know, it's a journey for you. It's not just the hunt. Yeah. And I mean, journey of life for the most part, I probably should post more like real life stuff, but I don't know. Everybody just wants to see all the hunting and those things, but the words never really match what is in the photo. So, yeah. but it's, no worries. yeah. That's what it is. I'll send you, I'll send you over that video. And um, yeah, when you get yeah. up here, let me know when you get moved and everything. Cause uh, chances are probably June or July, I'll end up in Montana or Wyoming anyway. So cool. I'll be at that. Yeah, I'll good. have the horses too. So that'll be a good experience. A lot of people are wanting to know like how to do the DIY horseback thing. And cause the whole horseback hunt is a, a dream for most people. And it's a, uh, it's a unique experience. And I have draft horses and they're not small. <laughs> it's like riding Clydesdales around. So yeah, hey, they could do a lot of work. They'll get to places thirty-five miles back. You know, <laughs> exactly. Two days. So. Well, listen, dude. Thanks. Hey, do you give out uh, your so the Instagram? Oh spot, yeah, or? my Instagram social media is Relentless Hunter, but the Hunter is uh, H N T R. So take out the U and the E, and you can find me there. And uh, I, I need to be a little bit more active. I haven't been very active this this winter time. I don't know if I've, I've just been stuck inside too much but um i got a bunch of, i'm gonna do a bunch of gear posts and and some of those other things coming up and talk about the stuff that i use and so yeah if you guys get the opportunity to go on and, and check it out and let me know what you guys think and bill athletics right that's your website bill athletics uh yeah. yes bill athletics is is one of them at the moment and i'll have some more stuff that'll come up here pretty soon uh supplement line and everything's going to be under bootleg um bootleg gear so you'll be looking out for that stuff that it comes up this summer actually because turnaround takes forever okay so cool. all right but, man well thanks again well, come thanks on for, i appreciate it yeah thanks for having me and do it anytime roger that. see you jeff see ya <laughs>